Uh, dear participants, uh, beloved speaker of the day, uh, Mr. Jacob and uh, faculty uh, members. St. Albert's College Autonomous uh, is celebrating its Platinum Jubilee, that's the 75th year of its existence. And in connection with uh, the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, we take this opportunity to remember our founder patron, Archbishop Joseph Atipeti. And this international lecture series is in his remembrance. The great missionary of Archdiocese of Arapoli, who initiated a lot of educational institutions as well as the social institutions in the district of Ednaculum in those years. The St. Albert started in 1946. The great missionary initiated the higher education in 1946. Earlier in the 18th century onwards, we had our the school as well as the other allied institutions. And Archbishop Joseph Atipeti now is in the process of sainthood. And now he is in the level where the Catholic Church called him as a servant of God. We believe that uh, a day will come that when the church will declare him as a saint based on his a lot of activities as well as his real love towards the Christ. Moving to my responsibility to introduce our speaker for the day, our beloved uh, Jacob, Jacob M. Hauser. He is basically a professional neuro language coach based in Saudi Arabia, who holds a master's degree in applied linguistics, specialization in pragmatics from MIS University. And he also has sound knowledge in religion and philosophy uh, with a lot of certifications like Neuroscience, the electrical properties of neuro hard decks, accelerated management program, a trainer a license for ELC language coach training, professional neuro language coaching, advanced neuro language coaching, and even the TFL training aspects. So the St. Albert's College Autonomous, in association with the Department of English, is organizing this lecture, the lecture on neuroscience and language learning. And on behalf of college as well as the department, I cordially welcome our beloved resource person for today, Jacob Yakub Hauser, uh, to this gathering. Hearty welcome, Mr. Jacob. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Sir now it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's about uh, the participants over here, the learned faculty members of the various colleges as well as the St. Albert's, especially from the Department of English, and uh, the students of St. Albert's as well as the registered participants. I'm really happy that uh, we had somewhere around uh, 100 registrations and 46 have joined. I believe that in the uh, coming time, the others will also join with us. I hope so. I wish each and every one that this session will be a fruitful and you can gain a lot of knowledge from this. Hearty welcome to all the learned faculty members as well as the uh, uh, students, the participants. Hearty welcome. And it's, it's the time to hear Mr. Jacob's words on neuroscience and language learning. Over to you, Mr. Jacob. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Um, really, um, so, so very kind of you. Um, I really, I couldn't be any happier 
I'm, I'm really glad to be here uh, with you today and uh, happy platinum uh, congratulations on your uh, platinum jubilee as well celebration. Um, without further ado, um, you are all welcome, all, all participants who are already here and uh, the others who, are, who might join any minute, again, you, you are all welcome. Uh, please feel free to stop me any time, ask questions. Um, I'd love this session to be more interactive than just me um, um, talking all the time. So please, please jump on the mic, um, use the chat box, however, if you're free. Right, um, I've got to start sharing my screen with you now. And... Um, Right. So, um, Mr. Anthony, am I need from you confirmation if I'm sharing my Perfect. screen? Perfect. Yeah. Already? Yes, we could uh, see your screen. That's good. Right, so technology is taking its time. Um, it might pop up any minute now, and there we go. So Perfect. welcome again, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, welcome again, and um, to this presentation about neuroscience and language learning. And the up to, the objective of it is how to help ourselves to learn more and more effectively. Um, to begin with, the significance of neuroscience. Um, so why neuroscience is important. Um, neuroscience, um, compared to other fields of humanity, um, is not really as ancient as other fields and aspects. Um, at least not the way we, we have it today. The, um, in the recent uh, decades, it has developed and improved um, quite a lot that we try to integrate this science into so many aspects and language is, is one of those aspects. So the brain is the control center. Um, this is um, a basic fact for all of us uh, that our brains, um, even though um, they weigh only um, 2.5 of our whole body, but actually they are the, the, the realm, if you like, of the executive decisions. So they, may, they have control over the whole, whole body, um, whether giving orders, receiving orders, regulating, uh, monitoring, and in general, just keeping, uh, keeping us alive. Um, so that's the control center, the brain. Um, point number two, the brain is connected with the heart. Now, what I mean by this is researchers have found that in the heart, we have a similar network, neurons network, that is similar to the one in the brain. And now they call it actually the heart brain. So there is um, like a strong connection between the brain and the heart. And the heart as well sends a lot of messages in, um, influencing and affecting the brain. So that's a really strong connection. And then moving from the heart, we have the gut. And I'm sure you are familiar with, the, with expressions like, I feel it in my gut and or what's called sometimes intuition. Um, we have expressions like having butterflies in our gut. And actually they found that the brain is connected with the gut with the, a neuron that's called the vagus neuron. And whatever you feel in your, in your gut actually goes directly to the brain and vice versa. 
so that the brain connecting and controlling the these three main areas the heart and the gut and then from there the whole the whole body um, there are billions of neurons in, in the brain and they fire um, billions of, of, of signals electrical signals I'm going to play this video for you here and I'd love to hear your feedback after you see this experiment that's called the glass brain and it shows you the, the, the amount of neurons really billions and billions of them and how they constantly firing from the day we born until the, the end of our days so might be easier just for me to play the the um, the video there you go so as you can see that's how neurons the the ones in yellow and how they're firing constantly, non-stop. And then you can see certain areas of the brain uh, brighten up according to what the body is doing at the time because each area is involved in certain jobs and tasks. So that's our brain and this experiment is called the glass brain. Here we are going inside our brains. Right, back to the um to the presentation um ladies yes yes i'm sorry i have to start the blame the apologies all right all right stop playing now yeah apologies so um Right, so back to the presentation. So that's that's significance of neuroscience, and which is basically start uh, from our brain. Um, just a little bit about um, neural language coaching. Um, uh, this is uh, the certificate of, I've got a professional certificate in, and it's a method uh, created by Rachel Paling, and it's basically integrating neuroscience into coaching into language teaching accredited by the International Coaching Federation ICF um, I'm not going to stay long on this um, slide but please feel free if you want to ask more about it have any questions uh, just jump on the mic I think it'd be easier Right, I'm trying to move on to the next slide. So please bear with me as I tackle technology here.
Right. Sir Anthony, I think. Yes, yes. Right, so allow me to just stop it, ladies and gentlemen. I do apologize. Uh, my video playing. Anthony? Uh, no, you have to restart the PowerPoint. I think. Yeah. Yeah, because I can hear a video playing. Can you hear it? No. All right, so this is mine then. Right. That's right. Uh, do you still can see uh, this the screen? Yes, the desktop screen. Yeah. Right. That's that's my horse, by the way, Black Torch. <laughs> so okay. while we while I'm reopening the uh, the presentation. Right. So meanwhile, um, if you if the audience um have questions, please. Uh, Feel free to uh, to ask or thought thought your thoughts about the video probably if you have any feedback or comment. What is that experiment experiment called? Anina. Well, that experiment is called the uh, the uh, brain glass. It's basically just to show, give us an insight of what exactly and how the, uh, our neurons firing um, actual electrical signals sending between neurons. And actually, that's that's basically how we how we are functioning as human beings so if you google uh the glass brain um, you will get that um, experiment so thank you for uh, the question for nina we might get another question I might have a window for another question before. Uh, you're very welcome. Very welcome. Right, so here we go again. Right. Um, characteristics of the brain. Um, the reason we talk about characteristics of the brain because the more we know about our brains, the more we are able to understand them, and then the more we know how to, in a way, communicate with our own brains. And once you do that, that will be a great help for you um, to choose what to learn, how to learn it. Um, because sometimes what we do is we go against what the brain the brain likes and in this case we might have a bit of conflict when, when, when uh, tackling issues like memories for example you might study something and then you try to send it to your long-term memory but for some reason you always lose it and that goes down to 
the fact that we might be doing something that the brain doesn't like, doesn't prefer, and therefore that in a way will be an obstacle on the way of our learning. So no two, two brains are the same. And actually like um, fingerprints, you know, the whole world, like billions of people there, however, they know two, um, almost no two people with the same uh, fingerprints. And that's the same when it comes to our brains. Um, we have indiv individual brains. And so if you see like certain people are good at something, are uh, doing it a certain way, it doesn't mean that I have to do it the same way to be good at that thing as well. I might need a different approach, a different style, so that's the fact that no two brains are the same. Again, characteristics of the brain. Um, it is important to always strive for a calm brain. Now, the reason we need calm brains all the time, especially when it comes to learning, and in this case we're talking about, we're focusing on languages. Um, languages are a huge subject when we want to learn them. They're really huge, complicated. Um, you got thousands and thousands of, of words and, and letters and sounds. And so unless our brains are really calm, they will always be distracted. I'm going to show you here how um, our brains might be distracted. Um, it goes down to what we call the amygdala. Now the amygdala in, in the brain is this part that's constantly looking for, for danger. Sometimes looking for a word, but most of the time is looking for danger, like a radar. And if you ask what is what the reason is, because basically our brains want to, to save us. So the, the first objective for the brain is survival. So that's the amygdala. It's constantly looking for, for danger. Danger can be a lion chasing you, or it can be some old um, experience, which is not, not a good memory you had um, um, one day. Um, it, could, it could be something like um, related to our emotions, like being embarrassed or, or even, you know, being confused or sad. Or, so all that means that the brain is not calm. And once the brain is not calm, the amygdala has this effect on the limbic system. Now, the limbic system is connected to so many parts of the brain and they all together call the limbic system. Um, one part that is connected to is senses. So as we are learning, um, we need our senses. The limbic system is connected to our senses. However, if the amygdala is sensing some danger, it's going to provoke the limbic system and send alert. Once you do that, the limbic system is going to act on our brain. And then the thinking area, which is here, is going to be excluded. Because now the limbic system is going to send all the resources to our performing brain, which is some, some, somewhere at the back, and will send the whole body into a state of panic. Therefore, if your brain is not calm, the amygdala is not happy, the limbic system is not happy, and then the brain is not able, not able to think. So now all the resources will go back to another area just to keep the, the, uh, the brain calm. This will send us into what we call the three F's. So please, um, if you can jump on the mic, um, what do you think uh, these three F's are? Just feel free, please, to jump on the mic. I'm not sure if I can read uh, the chat box now.
You can give me any guess. Um, all answers are accepted. Is anyone typing anything? Uh, maybe Mr. Anthony, you can help me with that if any, anyone is uh, typing anything. No, no. Right. So, uh, well, the audience, I think they're warming up, but please, please, please feel free to jump in at any moment. So the, the three Fs that the brain will go into, if, the, um, if you remember, the, the limbic system, if it's not happy, the three Fs are fight, flight, and then freeze. And then you can imagine, if you want to fight, there is no time for learning. And if you want to flight, run away, again, there's no time for learning. And of course, when you freeze, that's it. it information will have no way to go into our brain. Um, and remember, the limbic system is connected to our senses. So hearing, um, even, you know, even smelling, uh, the visual um, uh, part of, of, of our body, which is the eyes. So all that will be, in a way, stopped. And basically, that's, that's, that's learning. That's learning being stopped. Um, if you want to learn and read more about this, uh, you can read about this model, it's called SCARF. Um, it's quite a famous model um, by Dr. David Rock, one of the pioneers in uh, neuroeducation. Uh, so the SCARF model, uh, status, certainty, uh, autonomy, relatedness and purpose. Now, now here's a question to to my dear audience, how to calm your brain? If calming the brain is really important, uh, now how to calm our brain? Whenever you find meet a situation that you're not really feeling comfortable, um, what are the things, what are the techniques that you do to keep your brain in a calm state so you be able to think to grasp to perceive information what do you think by the way um, um, if you if you're typing please um, mr. Anthony let me know um, sharing this the screen. I can't see the uh, the chat box. Or maybe I start with you, Mr. Anthony. How do you calm your brain? I want to have a yeah, yeah. I'm getting some. Sorry. I'm getting a uh, may meditation, deep breathing. Penina okay, Muhammad, yeah. positive affirmation. Almost fix and relax. Yeah. So for those are the three Thomas. responses. Yeah. Thomas Dixon listening to music. Department ah, okay. of Botany 3116 drawing. Absolutely. Yeah. We've been yeah. And positive thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're getting all my answers. That's yeah. that's really that's really great. Um, okay. There are endless number. Thank, thank you, Mr. Anthony. There are an endless number of, of techniques that we do and uh, to calm our brain. And again, remember that there are no two brains are the same. So what, keep me calm, what keeps me calm, it might not necessarily keep someone else's calm, other people like you. So we all have our different, um, let's call, uh, places to go to for sanctuary and, and getting calm. So um, th thank you for that. Here are some, some examples, yes, that was the first one I guess I've mentioned. So breathing and meditation, um, 
or any other spiritual um, um, activity you do because that basically takes us away from all material materialism if you like and somehow that has great effect on, on, on our brain focus on any positive and um, yes was it Fanny? I think you mentioned that and that's right um, our brains act to anything that we feed them so if we feed positive the brain will go into a positive um, yes it might be challenging um, I would never say that it's just that easy but at least we start we take that step towards focus um, on, on the positive now moving forward um, what we have usually um, we might have an issue a dilemma dilemma at the moment at the present and then we can use that focusing on positive to think about the future and that's how we shift our thinking from now where the dilemma is into moving forward to something to something positive visualize positive and um, ladies and gentlemen the brain um, loves visual visualization it loves it because for the brain reality and and um, fiction if you like or imaginary in a way the same and this is why when we uh, when we have a dream or just remember emotions when you remember happy moments we instantly feel happy when you remember sad um, moments, sad memories, again, you instantly feel sad, even though it might be something that happened a long time ago. So for the brain, you just visualize, and the brain will react as if it's real. And actually, there is a, um, a study about how visualizing, practicing, um, they did a study on uh, pianists, and they asked a group to visualize a certain um, 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 training, and then the other group is actually doing do that training. And they they have found yes, when you do it, you definitely better. But when you just visualize it, they have det detected um, improvement. So that's the power of um, visualizing. Um, focus on what we can control and you know um, nowadays uh, the whole world is going into uh, something probably uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we've ever experienced anything uh, like it before so a lot of and a lot of these things are just out of our control we can't control them. focusing on what we cannot control um, usually doesn't keep the brain calm. If the brain is not calm, um, the limbic system is not happy, if the limbic system is not happy, learning and education will be always blocked. Similar to, to languages, uh, learning a language, a language is, is a huge task. And it is important to focus on the things that you can do it and in a way you get chunks of the language and then you focus at each chunk at, at, a, at a time and that helps the brain get in um, control and then therefore um, keeping the limbic system calm and let the, uh, the resources flow to the thinking brain, which is uh, in the frontier of the cortex. Awareness of what is happening, and by this I mean now you know, whenever you feel like there is something is getting more and more challenging as you study it, and then you might be, you might want to be aware of what's going on in your brain. So whenever you feel um, emotional, let's say, while, while learning, and now you know that, oh, the limbic system actually is getting provoked. And until I calm it down, um, learning and education will be a little bit 
and sometimes a lot um, challenging. So awareness of what's happening and eventually um, acknowledging that, yeah, that's fine. Um, it's okay to, to, to have those moments when we feel, let's say, frustrated sometimes. And again, feeling frustrate, frustrated, again, that will be against the flow of, of knowledge. So acknowledging that, and then from that, you can move forward, you can um, use your techniques into calming your brain. Right, um, any questions by, uh, by this moment, ladies and gentlemen? Um, so to carry on, um, another characteristic of the brain is brain's plasticity. Uh, now again, here's a question uh, to you. Um, any idea what brain plasticity is? Does this help? Right, so, so that's a picture of, of a single neuron. And neurons, when they connect, and when they uh, send signals from one, one between, between each other, that's how learning happens. And brain's plasticity is basically if two neurons are connected, and then this path is not working for any reason, the brain has um, the ability to find new routes. So if these two connected are not happening, um, the learning is not happening, neurons have the ability to find another direction. And think of it like, um, like um, like GPS and, and maps and, and driving. When you use your GPS, uh, you might find that one road is, is blocked or there, there's heavy traffic. And then you recalculate, and G, the GPS will find a new route. So that's our brain's plasticity. It's basically how we can forever change our brains. If one route is not working, we can always find a different route. And that's basically to change circuits, find new paths, and rewire. So that's our brain's plasticity. Um, there are some interesting facts about this, because we talk about habits. Might be hard to change. Yes, they are hard to change. And the reason um, habits in a way have been engraved into our brain so those roads of habits are really strong and what we do um, sometimes is trying to stop habits now this is really challenging however the trick is instead of spending any time and energy trying to stop one habit you can always create a new habit let's say I'm learning a language and I'm trying to memorize as much vocabulary as possible, but I'm reading uh, vocabulary from lists and it's not working. It might have worked before, but now it's just not working. Now I'm trying to find a new, a new path, a new habit. By doing that, you focus on what might work, and then you start doing it over and over again, and then the old habit will shrink and um, there is a video I'm not going to play it now because playing videos might be a little bit um, problematic but they show how certain areas in the brain are thicker stronger than others so they're thicker because neurons you know are, are keep connecting through, through that route and that's usually habits and the brain loves habits because it helps the brain running into um, um, safe, so, um, a low mode, like low energy mode. And that's saving energy. And again, that goes back to the fact that our brains always constantly um, finding ways to save us as human beings. 
Um, aging and continuous learning state. Have you ever heard that as we grow older, we lose the ability, the ability um, to learn? So, um, I'm imagining that there are some yeses or, or nodding. Yeah, we, we might have heard of this. Um, so this statement actually is right and, and wrong at the same time. Yeah, we, it might get more and more difficult as we age, but not because we don't have the ability anymore. The only reason is because our habits are really strong. So as you age, your brain still plastic, still has its plasticity. You can uh, remould it, you can change it. Um, the only thing is it might take longer time. And this is why they say children are better learners, um, only because they, they still um, have you know, a long way to go to put and engrave into their brains. But as, as we get older, our brains still have uh, their plasticity. So don't you worry about this. It's always, it's always about, once you focus on it, uh, find new ways, try to make those new ways as your new habits, and then you will be able to uh, learn new languages, um, new, um, you can start new careers, uh, whatever you can set your brain to. Um, obstacles against um, in um, against brain plasticity uh, can be either physical or psychological or anything related to psychology, uh, and both can be overcome by constant training uh, to our brains, and that's, ladies and gentlemen, uh, brain plasticity. Um, if, any, if there are any questions, please, uh, at this moment, uh, feel free. And if you don't ask me questions, I will ask you. Right, so we carry on with the characteristics of the brain. Um, Another characteristic is that we have in the brain what we call the thinking brain and the performing brain. So the thinking brain is basically the brain that is in front of the brain, the whole brain. So that's the thinking brain. Um, and it's where we do um, the uh, logic, mathematics, um, in a way, these higher order um, demand, they all happen um, in the thinking brain. While the performing brain is usually we, we, where we um, store habits and, and the performing brain is basically the gate to our long-term memories. Yes, we think as we um, tackle new um, issues, as we learn new vocabulary, as we learn new grammar, uh, we use the thinking brain. And then the, the way to send it back to the long-term memory is to engage the performing brain. And the more you do, the more you are sending things back to your long-term memory. And here's a famous quote, tell me and I forget. Teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. So involve me, let me do it. As you learn a language, um, yes, you can hear a lot of um, ideas from people. Unless you get yourself engaged and involved in doing, usually um, the chance of the new lad let's say vocabulary going to the long-term memory might be a little bit uh, uh, low. The trick is to balance the two. So using the thinking brain, are uh, they both important? But then 
to make uh, something newly learned um, really strong in, in your memory, just keep practicing. In languages, um, again, how do you practice? That's your own brain, your own style. What is the style you prefer when it comes to practicing? Um, characteristics of the brain again. Um, neurons wire together with the aid of brain's chemicals. Um, I'm, got, I'm just going to mention here two chemicals, the dopamine and the cortisol. So the dopamine is the fun chemical and it helps wiring. Um, any way that you can do and have fun or enjoy or, or laugh or feel relaxed, it helps the brain producing this chemical, the dopamine, and the dopamine will make wiring stronger. On the other hand, we have the cortisol, which is the social um, pain um, chemical. And it, um, it does the opposite of what the dopamine does. So here's a quote. One single dose of cortisol not only disrupts memory in the hippocampus memory, uh, but it also has a substantial effect on the plasticity of sensory areas of the brain. And learning languages is all about memory. And this is why we don't want cortisol to, to get mixed, to get in the mix of that. Social pain, um, it can be um, embarrassment, sadness, feeling um, excluded, um, being afraid of anything. So all these, we try to minimize these feelings. So we help the brain to introduce more dopamine and that will be a great help for enhancing our memories and therefore language learning. All right, let me check on my um, audience. Right, All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I may get some feedback from you now, just quickly, and then we will carry on. So please, um, I'd like to hear from you. For Nina, you said uh, ability to learn new things. Uh, may I ask you what was that related to? Sorry, uh, sir, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes. Uh, you have been talking about uh, you know uh, brain's chemicals like uh, dopamine and uh, cortisol uh, right. so uh, my question is uh, we always hear about uh, brain boosting food items and all uh, is yes. it just a myth or uh, is it a reality is well, it just a um, yes is it uh, uh, yeah, does it really work or we are just saying that uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, are these food items really good for the brain, or is it just a uh, creation or a construct? Well, um, that's a really good question, um, and that might take a nutrition to answer if this is really uh, the fact. Um, honestly, I'm not sure about um, that if there is a certain um, um, type a food that helps with, um, let's say, memory and learning language. Um, probably all I know is some food might have certain vitamins and that might boost, but again, um, I'd say I'd leave that to a nutrition or um, a specialist um, in this field to, to really answer this. Okay, so thank you. You're very 
Right, I'm aware of the time, so um, yeah, let's carry on. Um, association and mother tongue. Um, the brain prefers um, safe mood and using already existing connections and memories. And we hear a lot when we're learning uh, languages that uh, some school of thoughts might say don't depend on the mother tongue. Um, but what we say is, um, as each and every one of us has their own individual brain, um, some brains might prefer actually to use um, what's already there. And in a way, basically this is the way brains work. They always check if you have um, certain information, certain piece of information already there, so they use that instead of learning something new. And knowing this now, we know how sometimes we bring from our mother tongue um, some, let's say, um, grammatical structure into the target language. And that's, that's absolutely perfect because for the brain, why do I learn um, a new grammatical structure while I already have it? So sometimes by acknowledging that, comparing the two, and then you are reasoning now with your brain, and then the brain will realize, ah, okay, I, so I already have this, but you don't want it, you want to build another structure, and that's another way to move forward. So rather than just always fighting with the brain and thinking, oh, this is a mistake, this is a mistake, yeah, it could be, but there's always a reason for, for those mistakes. So we need to be always aware of certain aspects of, of the language in our mother tongue, uh, look at them, uh, inspect them, study them, analyze them, and then probably uh, compare them with the target language. And that way you show your brain a bit of logic, and then that will help you then to stop the influencing of the mother tongue. Um, how does the brain prefer to learn? Uh, commitment, um, commitment and motivation. These two are really uh, not um, fuel to our brains to help us going forward. Um, so, what is commitment? Now, I really need to hear from um, our beloved audience. So, what do you think commitment is? If anyone is typing, that's fine. We can go to uh, see the chat box. All right, dedication, yeah, persistence, absolutely. And um, so how can we ensure then, again to the audience, how can we ensure we get commitment when we start learning? So we, we can get committed basically by asking ourselves, are we committed? And then we need to get a yes or no and or no answer. Um, if we get a yes answer, that's fine. And then we need to know where um, the level of our commitment. And that's the first step to, 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 be, to, to get commitment and to be committed. So again, always um, acknowledging and always checking with the brain, always checking with oneself if we are committed or not. If not, then you go and chase the reasons why. And if you're committed, that's fine. Where am I in a level, say, one to ten? And then from there, you try to work on yourself how to um, get more commitment. Uh, motivation. Um, motivation is the spark. And it's not just the reason why we want to do something. It's visualizing where am I going to get in the future with this. So learning languages, it's always helpful to visualize in the future 
what it, what impact learning this language and being good at it is going to be and have on my future on my life um, and this, we do the same with motivation so are we motivated how motivated are we um, these questions help help us really get in step by step and moving forward um, ownership and taking responsibility this is another way the brain loves to learn and Here's another quote, it is the one who does the work, who does the learning. So our brains love to be responsible. It's like driving. Um, we love to drive our own cars and we love to be in control. Um, I'm going to move um, quickly now, I'm aware of the time. Um, emotions, we tapped uh, briefly on those and how important acknowledging our emotions um, is. Uh, they really are a key point when it comes to learning uh, languages. Three things we can do with emotions, always acknowledge them. Um, suppressing and, and hiding our emotions usually will keep the brain in a, um, a, a, a the three F state, so fight, flight or freeze, and that will be blocking our learning resources. Um, experience them. Um, that's okay, live through them, and that's our way into getting out of the, those emotions, express them, express them, if you want to show them that's fine. Once you do that, now the brain will have to think of something else. Um, thank you so very much everyone, thank you for your time, so if you have any questions, please feel free. I'm going to start sharing now. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, hello. Kavya, yeah? Hello. Uh, sir, I have a doubt. Like, um, when we yawn, uh, uh, like, we feel very sleepy and we, we feel very tired. But I have read it somewhere, like, when we yawn, our brain is getting ready to receive things. So, is it true? <laughs> this is just my doubt. No, actually, uh, okay. Um, that has a scientific... Um, um, fact behind it um, but this is the first time I hear it connected to yawning actually but it has a scientific fact behind it because our brains are moving between uh, waves brain waves and yes so the slow waves are usually so delta and theta and then alpha so if you're moving from slower to faster, so delta, theta, alpha, and then beta, and then gamma. The slow, the slow um, brain waves, actually, yes, they are, they call them the gate towards memory and the gate towards learning. And they're usually connected with uh, deep meditation and, and, and states before, right before sleep. And if you, if you re notice or if you hear that why kids are really good with sleeping, sorry, are really good with learning, because they're usually in those waves, the slow waves. So, yes, I'd say that has a strong uh, um, scientific fact behind it. I'm not sure about yawning, to be honest, but yes, we always try to keep the, the brain into those slow waves, and that is really helpful. They call them the gate. Uh, so these are the gate towards learning. So um, I hope uh, that answers your question. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Thomas here, um, standing against the adverse situations. Would you like to uh, elaborate on that, Thomas? Uh, can I speak to you, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, once again, good afternoon, uh, Jacob, good sir. Afternoon. I'm speaking from Tichu. 
uh, is I have a, a strong doubt that whether that is uh, late night. My daughter, she is pursuing uh, BA literature, and uh, I'm a retired person, and um, she often says that you no know, late night uh, learning, late night learning. Please, uh, yes. I don't know whether what we are discussing whether it is connected. Uh, late night learning. Uh, makes her more, more, uh, more and more uh, ability. She has got better ability to understand things in uh, during late night learning. I, I'm telling late night in the sense that even from uh, 11:30 to 1:30, if you see that two hours is more fruitful uh, than any other hours in the in a given day. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is, is it, uh, that uh, timing regarding that one? Uh, you, you have yeah. mentioned that yeah. regarding, uh, you know. Uh, the thinking brain and the performing brain. Thinking brain versus yes. performing brain you mentioned. That performance of the brain, uh, is there any particular time uh, during a given day, the performance of the brain, the maximum? Can you elaborate upon yeah. that? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you. That's another interesting question. So probably uh, regarding your daughter and learning and uh, trying to study at night, um, that might be due to the fact that at that time our brains just start slowing down. And then again, um, as per uh, Kavia's question, um, long as we go back to the slow and, and, and deep waves, brain waves, and then yes, that, um, that is the way actually to, to help and maximize and optimize our learning. Now, the the quick waves, uh, we can jump into them and then out of them. But it's never advised to stay a lot in the alert, alert, alert. Um, we need we need to do a mathematical pro uh, pro uh, problem. Uh, we use the thinking brain, high waves, quick waves, and then um, it's better to go back to the slow uh, and deep waves, and that will help yes um uh, will help us uh, send a lot of memory um to the deep uh, long time memory and so again i i i only connect that with that but again um hearing it with late night study i can't just um uh, claim that but I, but i kind of see the reason and the rationale behind it yes um as for the performing brain um I really, I'm not sure if there is um, a certain time of the day, but that's again to the individual, since our brains are, are just individual and, and in a way tailor-made uh, for us. So whatever your brain, whatever the time that your brain prefers to learn and to perform, then that's the time we should give our brains the maximum uh, performance. I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Jacob. Thank you. Very well. I personally, I feel it's the early morning is the best time. That is what I personally feel. <laughs> I, I experience yes. That's why no, uh, my childhood onwards, uh, we have been yeah. practicing that one. Uh, I belong to a family of 11 members. All of us sit together yes. in the early morning. We get up, go to the church, and come back. Then sit down. At that yeah. one hour in the early morning, it makes a lot of uh, I mean, uh, contribution to our I mean, learning. Learning process. That's yes. what I <laughs> New generation no, thinking and the opposite. That's what I feel. <laughs> I'm, 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 I agree with you. I'm an early bird myself. But th then is, and we have all this, you know, early bird catches the worm. Yeah. Um, but it's always, it's, it goes back again to the individuals. Otherwise, I, at night, I think I, I can be really useless. I can't learn anything. I prefer to wake up early in the morning. Just like you, but then our children or different uh, people people might feel no. Actually, in the morning I feel sleepy, and there was like discussion. In, there are discussions in certain countries about when to start the um, uh, the school day. Do we start early in the morning, or do we just start late in the morning? And to be honest, I always say it all goes back to the individual when they like to learn until in the in the future might we might get further research and, and something might be um, uh, proved later on so um thank you thomas um, i'm reading the chat box 
thinking about side effects of not doing our duty to an extent it help to an extent helps to be um, committed yeah that's that's right that's right <laughs> that's right you can uh, we can we can think of that as long as we don't go into panicking situation uh, we don't want that to happen so, to the uh, to the brain um, thank you yeah you're welcome Thomas uh, is this truthy hey uh, why why is that a person with mental health issues really good at giving advice <laughs> Uh, advice and tips for people who goes through the same and not wow i really don't know i really don't that's i i i will write this question down and and look at it because i love how yeah you, see, if, you might take um and i've heard something about it to be honest before but i i really can't claim or answer anything about it so sorry about that Ruthie. I, I put a note and I, I, I look at it really. So, no, thank you. Thank you very, very much. You, you're welcome as well. You're really welcome. Thank you. Um, Mary, um, what, wondering thoughts. Um, now this is quite a general question, and um, um, an interesting one. So controlling uh, your wandering thoughts. Um, am I hearing that your wandering thoughts are something that you are not really happy with? Oh, um, right. Um, maybe this. Um, all right. I believe to answer this question, uh, Mary. Uh, uh, sorry, is it Mary? Yes. To answer this question, um, I do believe that you might need to, because there are a lot of things I'd like to ask about it. But um, I say, wondering thoughts. If you think about it in a positive way. Uh, they are great for learning um, and that's the reason they always say about children from the age of um, four, two to four they usually they use a lot of their imaginative brain because the thinking brain is not fully uh, developed so they keep imagining a lot and that's a, uh, a big reason they are really good at learning However, if you mean by wandering thoughts, the thoughts that distract you, um, again, they usually have, have a reason uh, why they're distracting you. Uh, the first step, like our fears and our different emotions, acknowledge that, that's all right. You acknowledge that there are some thoughts that are distracting you, and then the brain will look at them instead of running away from them. So we can't, we cannot run away from a wandering thoughts or emotions or feelings. So we face them. So once you face them, and then the brain will use the logic. So and and then again, uh, you yourself, Mary, will know better how to control them once you acknowledge them, experience them, live through them. Um, there is usually um, way out. Way out is usually through our emotions. So. If I may say, yes, I acknowledge them, experience them, express them, and that will hopefully be a great help. I hope that answers your question, Mary. Fanina, thank you. Um, uh, I really thank you. I'm really uh, grateful. I can't thank you enough, um, everyone, the audience, the department, Mr. Anthony, really for uh, providing this great opportunity. Um, Thomas, yeah, again, um, really the main thing is to acknowledge our, our feelings, our fears, acknowledge them, and then your brain will find the way. It's always it always starts with acknowledgement. Um, so, like di dilemmas, they are there, and just we can't run away from them, and it's okay. Um, according to neuroscience, you know, our brains are always up and down, up and down. That's fine. Um, yes, we try to 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 stay. Up more but there is no way out of going down again and this starts from the 
the smallest, the teeny tiny neurons, when they shoot an electrical signal, it starts threshold, shoots up, go to the potential, um, uh, and then goes down. And this is how we, how we, um, this, this is basically human beings. So yes, please do acknowledge them and then you've run away. Um, is that caveat to have the same concerns? Yeah, and that's great. Always acknowledgement. Um, there, there is something fearsome. I always say it, say it out loud. That's fine. And then the brain will find a way. Um, mind palace. I'm not sure if I know what mind palace is. Mind palace. Alice. So yeah, you're welcome. So uh, is this uh, so Department of Physics uh, four nine two two? Would you like to uh, elaborate more? So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sir. Yeah. So I read that is a technique to store information in your mind by creating a yeah. place inside your mind. So yeah. whenever, whenever you want it, you can just go inside your mind and take a kind of look at it. Right. Um, I'm not sure. Well, I understand you now. Uh, thank you very much. But I'm not sure if I know what that place or uh, is. To all I know is, um, um, yes, memory. We have like uh, memories are kept in our um, in our brain. They're engraved there, long and short memory. Uh, but other than that, um, the only thing I can talk about here um, is in the general term. But Really, that might need a, sign, uh, uh, a neuroscientist, and um, that's not me yet. So uh, I do apologize for if that doesn't answer your question. Um, Fanina, you're asking about. Fanina, could you please, would you like to come on the mic and tell me more about? I'm not sure if I know this um, fascia and brain, or if you'd like to type, that's fine. And you are very welcome, uh, Thomas, again, KK, you're very welcome. But I'll, um, I'll read more about actually this mind. Uh, so is it is it place then? Uh, sorry to ask again. Mr. Four Nine. No, it's, it's a palace. It's a palace. It's a palace. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just like in the Sherlock. Uh, how the Sherlock uh, does in, in it's, it's a fictional character, but uh, but right. uh, I would like to uh, connect it in such a way that it's it's the easiest way That's, where he yes. predicts and he do the things and he uh, take back the events, uh, yeah. see the things and see the uh, stores the data all over uh, in different. Spaces and where he connects the dots. That's right. That's what I remember. Yeah. Well, well, usually, um, um, you know, um, you said it's just a fiction, but usually it has again, it has some so, uh, neuroscientific uh, facts behind it that might support it. But until we really say yes, it's happening, we might need uh, further research on that. So um, yeah, it's an area that we we will be looking at. Uh, sir, can you uh, hear me, sir? Yes, I, I can hear. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, aphasia is actually a condition where you have problem while producing or uh, you know comprehending things. Uh, so I yeah. was just wondering if you can uh, say something about how it is connected with the brain. Um, sorry. So what what is the nature of these uh, problems with the brain? Yeah, it is actually uh, connected with the, I, I think that it is connected with the language area. 
like uh, you yeah. know verdicts aphasia and uh, uh, then uh, right. one more is there. Yeah. yeah 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 production and comprehension yes um yes that that is really um thank you for the question yeah that is um again that is um higher level of of neuroscience and I remember, I think, no, thank you for reminding me. I remember um, uh, reading something about it while doing this course on, on neuroscience. Uh, and um, I'm not sure if I can really tackle that. All I know is that whatever part of our brain that is damaged, even physically, so there is like a physical uh, damage. And unless it's really severe, uh, where, um, let's say, a neuro, uh, neurologist or neuroscientist, neurologist usually, uh, connect them by performing surgeries. But a lot of, um, a lot of the, the damage, the obstacles, the, the obstacles as we presented them, even if they're fuzzy physical, we still can find a way around them. Um, that might need a um, specialist in um, uh, neuroscience. Uh, so, so again, it's something beyond the scope of my uh, uh, professionalism. Uh, but yeah, um, there is always a way around it, and that all thanks to the brain's plasticity. Um, different, probably, uh, level of damage might have different um, uh, time duration, um, so, if I may, please uh, say, um, I can look at this question again, but that's just definitely beyond my uh, scope. Yeah, sir. Yeah, sorry yeah, for that, you, Thank you, sir. You, you're really welcome. So, I think uh, uh, there's no more questions, and uh, we have taken... <laughs> more time than expected uh, yeah, we expected right. that we could wind up by 4 30 or 4 35 but we that's have taken right. uh, 25 minutes uh, and uh, more but all the participants were there from the beginning till the end that i appreciate that and that's uh, really the great. questions proves yes yes the questions that's also right. so the interactiveness uh, proves that uh, how uh, uh, you were all engaged in this uh, session and i'm really happy for that and let me take this opportunity to invite Professor John Sinoj, who uh, serves as assistant professor in the Department of English and who serves as a uh, ANO of uh, Army uh, uh, NCC, Wing of St. Albert's College Autonomous, and a proud Albertian. Uh, over to you, John Sinoj, sir, uh, for the yeah. award of thanks. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, um, um, I'm ex uh, good evening, all. Uh, I am extremely happy to be a part of this lecture series held in honor of uh, Servant of God, Archbishop uh, Joseph Petty. Then uh, neuroscience and language learning is in fact a topic that has great relevance uh, in the present scenario. And uh, just now uh, we had the wonderful opportunity to listen to our distinguished guest uh, who gave us an insight uh, um, uh, into new into how neuroscience and language uh, learning go in go hand in hand, and so at this moment I would like to thank all those people who made uh, this event uh, a very success. And firstly, I thank the most respected uh, Jacob Hoser, then uh, who with uh, uh, is in depth knowledge gave us all an insightful lecture uh, about uh, neuroscience and uh, its application in the field of language learning. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I would like to thank Professor Shine, uh, Dean of uh, Training and Development, for uh, his uh, painstaking effort in uh, organizing this event. Uh, then, without uh, his initiative, uh, this would never have been um, a reality. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shine, sir. Then, uh, next, uh, I extend my sincere gratitude to um, all the faculties uh, from the uh, English department and the faculties from other colleges and the students for being part of this uh, event and making it a wonderful success. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, sir.